Okay, we're ready. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our SETI Institute uh, colloquium series. My name is Frank Marchis. I will be the host of uh, this colloquium. Um, I will just start saying that Adrian cannot be here today um, because he's very busy with the arrival of a new member of his family. Her name is Emily. So please, let's give a round of applause for Adrian and uh, his wife. <laughs> Most likely, Adrian is watching that right now. <laughs> okay, so uh, today we are lucky to be joined by uh, Vita, Vitas Sunsparrow. Uh, Vitas is a senior, senior robotics researcher leading the Dynamic Tensing Lab, Intelligence Robotics Group, NASA uh, Vitas has developed robotic technology since he graduated from Central University in 1998. Um, Vitas is also an entrepreneur. Prior to being at NASA Ames, he was also the CTO of a company called Apisphere Inc. at Berkeley, which is a startup that built a, a cloud-based system for location-triggered location mobile services. His first startup in 1998 was Mobot Inc., which built fully autonomous robotic tour guides for museums. So Vitas is a researcher, an entrepreneur, but he also have a life. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, is, uh, he has a long interest in, uh, lifelong interest in human motion in many forms. That's include yoga, dance, martial art, and physical therapy. Mm -hmm. So today you are not going to talk about yoga, dance, or martial art. You are going to talk about refactoring space exploration with soft machines. So you are going to show us your new project uh, on soft robo funded by uh, NIAC, uh, for NIAC grant, a NASA as Institute. No. Innovative Advanced Concepts Program. Thank you very much. So please join me again and welcome Vitas. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. It's going to be fun to share this work with you. We're going to cross a lot of disciplines in the process. Uh, the question is, how do you explore other planets? and you know, we've been doing it with rovers, and that's a great way to go. But what you really want is machines that are so self-confident and so reliable in how they interact with the environment uh, that, that they are going to be robust and safe and don't require the enormous amount of attention and careful motion planning that we currently have to do, which makes them very slow. Uh, and so uh, as examples of that type of level of competency, we can look to biology. And that's really what we're going to dive into uh, in this talk, is how is it that animals and humans move, and how do we apply some of those insights from that question to, uh, to robotic exploration? Now, this, this question of mine really st has started with a lifelong interest in human intelligence, really desiring to understand how is it that we think and feel and have all these wonderful experiences that we have as humans. And uh, really coming to the insight that to get at an understanding of our brains and our intelligence, it's good to start by understanding how we move. Because if you think back, uh, the very first neuron that evolved, evolved to be a motor controller, to control the motion of a muscle. That is the basis of our computational system, and everything else has evolved since then and is layered on top of that. So if you understand the, the fundamental mechanics of motion, you get an insight to the foundations of everything else. Uh, including, you know, art and literature and, and the finer points of politics. Um, <laughs> so, uh, a quick overview of the talk, just so you have an idea of where we're going, because we're going to jump through a lot of different disciplines here. Uh, you know, the initial question is, again, how do our brains work? And, and how does that, how do we control this motion? We'll have a little quick insight into that, and then we'll immediately see that understanding the structure of the body, the physiology of the body becomes very important because you can't just talk about control separate from the thing that you are controlling. And it turns out that there's a lot of interesting emerging theories these days about how our uh, bodies are tension networks and as through the soft tissue that is the primary load paths in the body. And this is a very different uh, uh, model than our uh, common sense approach to understanding how the body works. Uh, from there, then one asks the question of this very strange tension network theory. What is that? It turns out there's a structure called tensegra. That is exactly this, and I have some examples here, um, which I can, you can pass around and start playing with. These are that's a tensegrity model, and here's the one. 
And there are structures where the primary load paths are in the tension network. Things are able to uh, and this has been used very heavily initially by Buckminster Fuller and, and Kenneth Snelson for certain architectural concepts, but is now starting to emerge as a uh, direction that we can start applying uh, robotics technologies to. And so from there, I'll dive into some of the robotics research we're doing at NASA and how we're looking at using those to uh, explore other planets. What are some of the advantages of this tensegrity based approach to designing robots? Uh, the big challenge, though, these things face is how do you control them? Because they are unlike the regular robots that we build, which are very rigidly connected, they, uh, they really present uh, a fundamental challenge to control engineering approaches. And so for that, we again return to looking at biology and dive into some of the uh, emerging research in neuroscience that looks at our uh, neurons as oscillators uh, and how uh, nature spontaneously uses the synchronization of oscillatory processes to create coordinated behavior and order. And so we see then at the heart of, uh, at the heart of our computational system, desi driven to uh, control uh, motion, but used throughout the brain, is a foundation based on oscillation and rhythm. And that this has significant Im implications for how we think about our back to the very beginning. And the conclusion of this whole talk I'll give it to you now, is that synchronization is the heart of our computational system. Yes, we can do math. That's amazing. Uh, but that's not the basis of how our computational system works. It's very different from our computers, which are built on binary logic. But instead, we, we use oscillation and synchronization. And then if you think about that as the basis of our intelligence, then you see a lot of things that humans do really well make sense as, as things that fall out of that approach. Uh, very different, uh, things that are very difficult for our computers to do. Things like pattern recognition and uh, categorization, association of similar things. These are very challenging pro problems in AI. Yet if you have a computational system built around this idea of oscillation and synchronization, these types of qualities fall out. And you end up even seeing these qualities through higher level behaviors of humans, such as our ability to uh, easily build community and build relationships with each other, our ability to uh, to form, um, um, synchronize as communities and patterns. So, you know, the way we, we uh, speak, the way we dress, the way we think tends to have a, a property of synchronizing amongst our communities. So that's the conclusion. To get there, let's start with the brain. So most people think about intelligence, you know, think even about motion. We think, OK, we use our brains to control motion. And uh, to an extent, that is true, but it's only part of the story. Uh, our brains are, there's a lot going on there, but at least as concerned with motion, they are uh, where a lot of our 3D sensors are located, right? Our ears, our eyes, to some extent our nose. These are the sensors that tell us about the world at a distance. And we do a lot of motion planning in our brain. The whole question of how am I gonna get from here to the lunchroom without running into anybody, right? That, that is a planning problem. But we do not, in our brains, plan the exact details of physical contact with the environment. The subtlety of how am I going to how am I going to touch this to pick it up carefully has to be done elsewhere because any amount of pre-planning is going to be imprecise given our noisy sensors and our estimations of the world. So we plan, we get rough ideas of how things are going to go in the brain, but the actual details of execution happen in the spine. And this is where you see classic engineering control circuits. For instance, you have the uh, uh, muscle spindles in the muscles, they are sort of strength, uh, uh, length and stretch sensors, and they are closed loop with the spine, right? So the, what th when that sensor is stretched, it has an immediate closed loop reaction with the spine to the muscle that it's associated with. Same thing with the Golgi tendon organs. These are basically strain gauges, and they're located where the, the muscles and the, um, and the tendons uh, come together. And this information eventually po uh, percolates up to the brain. But uh, the neurons turn out to be really slow. And the time delay it takes for that information to get to the brain and back down again is too slow for the details of actually managing forces in contact. You would end up getting a lot of jitter if you had that type of time delay in your control circuit. So there's a lot going on in the spine that's completely independent of the brain. And it turns out that people have done experiments on this. Uh, you've heard about chicken running around with its head cut off. 
Uh, that actually happens. You can go to a farm and see this if you want. Um, and, uh, and you know, it, it's, you know, people laugh about it or are grossed out about it, and they think, oh, well, it's just running around randomly. And pay attention to the detail, though. It, where it's going is randomized now. It has lost its sense of purpose. It is no longer planning its, its intention of where it's going because it has no brain. But the fact that it is standing and the fact that it is running implies that there is a massive amount of coordination between hundreds of muscles. Otherwise, if they were discoordinated and it was randomly firing at the muscles, it would be twitching on the ground in a pile of feet and feathers. And eventually that happens when it's, as the system falls apart. But, uh, but there is coordination in, in, and uh, uh, order while it's running. And so people have gone in and actually investigated this more. It turns out that you can sever the spinal cord of an animal below the brain stem and keep the animal alive. And uh, that animal will be, is capable of standing. It's capable of resisting applied forces and is capable of walking in different uh, uh, characteristic gaits. I'm going to show you a video of this next. It's of a cat. So it's a little disturbing, but these videos were made 50 years ago, and so they might as well be used because science has been done. And so this cat has no brain involvement. Its spinal cord has been severed and it's being kept alive. And as the, uh, as the treadmill speeds up, you'll see the cat go through multiple different gait cycles. It'll go from a walk to a trot to a gallop eventually. And so where is this coordinated motion coming from? Is It's a very, very key question to ask. Uh, it turns out that it, it's, it's obviously being coordinated by the spine, but it's really interesting because the spine is decentralized. There's no central locus of control. We tend to think about centralized control in the most of the time we think about intelligence. But this is decentralized control. Each vertebrae is its, its own module. So we're going to eventually get to the heart of how synchronization is used to get that type of uh, uh, coordination in the system. Uh, but the, the important uh, takeaway from this is that there is an enormous amount of capability in the body that's independent of the brain, the body and the spine. And so we want to look a little deeper into how that works and how you would get coordination uh, in this system. So many of you. Uh, in your classes, in biology classrooms, probably had this skeleton in the corner. And uh, it's worth realizing that that skeleton is telling you a bit of a lie, right? It, all the hinges that are holding those bones together are aftermarket additions. They don't exist in reality. And so if this were actually a pile of uh, bones, it would be a pile on the ground, not standing up like that. And so this is really an interesting question to dive into. How does force propagate through the body? Right? We tend to think of the skeleton as the infrastructure, much like the, uh, much like the uh, um, beams and girders and, and superstructure of our buildings. We are accustomed to thinking about linear compressive structures where the weight of the roof rests on the walls and the weight of the walls rests on the floor and that rests on the ground. But uh, that's not necessarily the case of how things work in the body. Um, oh yeah, there's an example of the building. We can skip that. Dynamic motion x-ray is fast becoming the most preferred tool to evaluate injuries due to trauma, such as auto, sports, and work-related accidents. Dynamic motion x-ray is fast becoming the most preferred tool to evaluate injuries due to trauma, such as auto, sports, and work-related accidents. Dynamic motion x-ray is fast becoming the most preferred tool to evaluate injuries due to trauma, such as auto, sports, and work-related. And it really speaks to this bigger story that we use, our bodies use connective tissue, the soft tissue, as the primary uh, structure of our physical body. Uh, the, the fascia, as it's called, is a elastic material that is, it is your tendons, it is your ligaments. These are actually really the same material. They're just named differently uh, based on the anatomist misunderstanding of the body early on. Uh, it's the same material that's the outer layer of the bones. That same, those fibers from the outer layer of the bones are continuous with what we call the tendons, and that's continuous with the sheaths that surround and are all throughout the muscles, uh, such as the myofascial uh, layers. And it, when you are embryotic, as you were first conceived, you start off as a mass of fascia with 600 or something pockets, and it's into those pockets that your muscles and bones later grow. So it is this soft tissue that fundamentally defines your form and your shape and, and what you are. And it's what is continuous through the body. 
The bones are discontinuous. Uh, so you can see there's a lot of interesting research being done these days, uh, such as folks like Tom Myers, who's been working with uh, uh, fresh cadavers that have not been preserved and dissecting them to track how fascia works in the body. It turns out that when you use formaldehyde to preserve a body, it glues all the fascia together and it loses its elasticity. And so layers that would normally move and slide relative to each other get glued into a big hunk. And it becomes very difficult to see the role that fascia plays. And so we have 100 years of anatomy research that was missing this very critical system uh, and how it, it behaves in the body. And so that's starting to be explored. This is very cutting edge research. And it's very interesting too, if you can ever go to a body world exhibit or one of these other types of uh, uh, preserved bodies, you can see this network of the fascia here sort of highlighted in white throughout the body. And you can see its continuous nature and the way it creates a web throughout the entire structure. So this idea of a, of a structure that's a tension network uh, is again very counterintuitive. It was first uh, really explored by Kenneth Nelson, who was an artist, and Buckminster Fuller back in the 60s or earlier. And the term tensegrity comes from tension and structural integrity. And it's the idea that instead of having everything resting on each other in a compressive structure like our buildings, you can have stable, uh, rigid structures that are maintained through their tension network. And so you end up with these very bizarre uh, art structures where the rods are just floating in space and, and they're really fun to go play on. There's a really nice large one on Stanford campus. You can go, well, eh, I won't say that you should, but you could climb it after dark. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, they have, it turns out, really interesting physical properties. The way tensegrity structures uh, distribute applied forces, uh, applied you know, stresses, is very unique. Uh, first of all, they are a very high strength to weight ratio structure. Um, ten materials under tension generally are stronger per uh, mass than compressive materials. And since every element is either in pure tension or pure compression, you don't have much, you, don't have mu you have far less to worry about in terms of bending and shear forces to resist. So you can use minimal structural uh, amounts. Um, you can have really thin rods rather than the thick rods that a, a pillar would require. More significant is that there are no internal lever arms. So if you, if you apply a force to one of these rods, it doesn't magnify like a lever into this joint over here. And that is a traditional problem with like a serial chain uh, robotic arm where you need really big motors at the base because you have me a meter or more of leverage applying magnified force into, those heavy, into that heavy joint. So you get away from that because applied forces instead diffuse through the tension network and the entire structure participates in absorbing the, that stress. So even when you push down on this rod here, these cables will actually participate and in, in increase in tension. Right? It's very counterintuitive. And you can play around with the, uh, the structures that are being passed around. So that passive global force distribution ends up being very useful for any structure that is going to move and might turn itself upside down. If you imagine every animal in the world has to deal with forces applied from every direction because you're always, being, uh, you're always under gravity's load. And even when you go from here to here, you're still having a force applied to you from a different direction. And if you do a handstand, it's completely upside down. Very few of our robots, very few of the things we build in traditional engineering approaches are designed to operate upside down. Um, it's just not a use case we generally consider. There are special cases, obviously. So uh, tensegrity structures in biology. It turns out that with all of these fascinating physical properties, that uh, there's a lot of evidence that this principle is at play in biological systems. So for the last 30 years, Donald Ingbar, who's at the uh, Harvard Weiss Institute, has been looking at cellular tensegrity and how at our fundamental cellular level, the structure of cells is uh, describable as a tensegrity structure. They're very efficient, again, in terms of uh, strength to weight ratio, so it makes a lot of sense. They're very adaptive to applied forces, and cells have to adapt to the force environment they're in at all times. There's other uh, researchers uh, initiated by St uh, Steve Levin and others under the title of biotensegrity, 
which is looking at the physiology of our bodies at the, at the gross scale, at our spines and our legs and, and, and everything that we do as tensegrity structures. And you'll see that uh, one of the models that I'm passing around is a spine-like model, and it's really fascinating to and uh, load bear on it. You can put weight on it, and the vertebrae don't touch because all the force is passing through the cable network. And that's really significant to, um, to realize that uh, you know, we have nerves coming out between each vertebrae, and, and yet why aren't we all having bulging discs and pinched nerves if we, you know, if we use the traditional mental model of vertebrae weighing on each other in a compressive manner? So that starts to make a lot more sense when you start thinking of uh, uh, modality. Just to, to get a little bit of uh, uh, insight into this, my particular v vision of all of this is that the tension network is really the primary load path for forces in your body. Right? When your muscles are activated, when you are in good alignment, then forces are not pressing compressively from bone to bone. Yet, we still need to, uh, being, being animals that need to survive the real world, need to survive all sorts of unexpected occurrences, we need to be able to handle a wide range of, of unexpected incidences. So th our bodies still have an ability to absorb compressive bone-on-bone -bone impacts. For instance, if you are running or jumping or getting some other high-frequency impact shock through your body, uh, that may cause a transitory compression of the bones. Uh, it's suboptimal, though. You don't want it to be continuous. And so this is where you see dysfunction in the body, is when your tension network, your musculature, and your, and your fascial system is out of alignment, and you end up with continuous compression between bones, say between vertebrae and the back. Then you get wear and tear. That really starts to break your body down. Um, and that's, it's really not the way to go. But it's a fallback mechanism that nature uses because uh, we have to survive all sorts of injuries in our lifetimes. So that was you know, a fun little uh, diversion to our bodies and how it might apply to all of us. Uh, the next question is, how do we use this for exploring space? So the NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Program, which looks at the sort of 20, 30 year out uh, uh, technologies that are emerging, uh, is supporting us in our application of tensegrity robots to space exploration, to planetary exploration. And the idea is to create a multi-purpose robot where this one structure can do many roles that would normally require different systems. So uh, uh, initial animation is that this system can be packed flat for launch because you always are constrained in your launch volumes, deployed when you get to another planet, and then used much like an airbag uh, at landing. These compliant systems can really absorb a lot of forces. And so you could have a payload suspended in the middle and have this safely protect that payload of instruments while you're landing. So why, why just make a new airbag? Because that very same structure then can be used for mobility. By actuating the strings, which you already had to do to deploy it and to get it ready for landing, uh, we've shown in a physics-based simulation that you could traverse a wide range of terrains and move around very reactively across different obstacles and uh, challenges. So, uh, so uh, then we actually tested it. Uh, this is a, our very first prototype that we, was made being dropped from 10 meter height. And that gives it a landing speed equivalent to the uh, terminal velocity that this type of structure would have on Titan. And that's sort of the reference mission that we've been designing towards. And uh, this one, this is an actuated robot that was able to pack itself flat and deploy and it's very easily able to survive that 10 meter fall. Uh, we have As other prototypes from built. their appearance in many biological by systems, a, a that came to structures have unique from, physical uh, properties, uh, Belgium, which make them Gambia ideal for a wide variety of autonomous robotics and, applications. Uh, it was designed not for landing, but for the controllable compliance and force distribution properties make for reliable uh, one and robust environmental interactions. Shape deformations can be used to accurately control the robot and enable locomotion. Move and roll which gives you a nice vision of what would happen if you had failures in the system, right? You have, if, if various motors failed during a mission, it would still be able to uh, move. And uh, so here it is moving around. We're working on our next prototype right now. It's gonna be uh, significantly more uh, As evidence from their appearance in, in many biological systems, integrity structures have unique. 
Other work we're looking at is uh, taking this spine inspiration and really trying to explore out how do you uh, take this idea of a tensegrity spine and apply it to robotics. And we made in simulation some initial prototypes, sort of a tetrahedral version of it, and showed that it was able to traverse a wide range of different terrains. The structure is very compliant and very adaptable to whatever environments you put it in. We'll come back to this story a little later when we get to the controls area, because this is where we did some really interesting controls research. And, and more importantly, there's this key idea, this key insight that if you uh, talk to any athlete, really you know, high level, high performing athlete for any background, you know, martial arts, dance, any sport, they will all generally share a key insight, which is that motion in your body starts at your core. This is where you really control and generate your motion. You know, and then that leads to footwork and all these other things that you do. But really, the core is the basis of your motion. And you look at an amateur, you know, give them a, a baseball bat or a tennis racket or, or whatever. And the first thing they do is they put all their effort into their arms. And they're swinging their arms around. And they haven't figured out how to use their core yet. They're very slow. They're very inaccurate. And so by learning to move from the core, you become more proficient at motion. Yet you look at all the robots that we build. Uh, especially humanoid robots or walking robots. We put a lot of effort these days into creating really complex legs and arms. They're compliant, they're adaptable, they have all sorts of amazing technology in them, and then we bolt them to a big rigid box. So robotics today is at that amateur level of movement. And to really get to the next level of having robots that are able to move with the grace and skill that we see in, in biology, in, in animals and humans, we need to really understand how to build flexible, compliant uh, spines and cores that enable the integration of forces from all the different limbs. And that's what these types of structures really do. They passively integrate the forces from the limbs in a really capable way. Um, we've, be bu we've built some hardware prototypes um, that are, you know, a lot of good first lessons learned, and there will be more iterations on those. And uh, another thing we're doing is we've been developing an open source simulator call it the NTRT, the NASA Tensegrity Robotics Toolkit. Uh, I have been waiting for a year and a half for NASA Legal to let me release it. If you keep checking back sometime in the next year, it will be, uh, maybe this month. And uh, the real vision here is to have a, 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 an environment that makes it very easy for people to build these structures in the physics-based simulator and to experiment with controlling with them. They are non-intuitive structures. It's not trivial to create them and to uh, explore their controls. And so we really want to help bring together a, a community, worldwide community of researchers who, who want to explore this and be ha give them an opportunity to start sharing software with each other and actually sharing executable models and, and, and control models. Because until now, all of the research in Tensegrity Robotics uh, has been balkanized. Every researcher has their lab. They write some papers. They write some algorithms. But there's no hands-on sharing of, of actual um, software. So I hope that that will uh, enable that in the near future. And that gets us to the heart, uh, really kind of the heart of this whole story, which is the control challenges. Besides all these awesome physical properties of these structures, they come with the challenge that they are very difficult, difficult to control. They are, uh, has this side of the room played with this model yet? OK. All right, here we go. Um, and uh, you know they're oscillatory. You can you can take these models we're passing around. You can see that they shake and they vibrate really easily. And, you know that's generally a nightmare for most traditional controls engineers. You always are trying to get rid of oscillation. And yet we uh, in in this approach try to ask the question: How can oscillation be used as an advantage? What can we do with oscillation that actually makes it a quality that makes the system work even better? Uh, they're structurally nonlinear. You know, you're, the mathematics of, of analyzing and, and looking at these from a centralized perspective is really complex. And all of our engineering tools and, and sort of modeling tools are designed towards systems that are connected. And so there's very few engineering tools to make it easy to think about these structures. Um, and so we find ourselves, once again, turning to biology to really look for some inspiration of how would you control such a complex, nonlinear, hard to model system. And this brings us back to this idea that life is rhythmic. If you really look at uh, everything in the world, everything that's alive, 
it's all very rhythmic, all very oscillatory. Even our non-living things are. I mean, there's a fundamental day-night cycle. Uh, you know, everything is cyclic on this planet. There is cycles in all things. And almost, almost what we do is cyclic. Right? I mean, you've got your heartbeat. That's pretty obvious. But uh, eating, it's a very rhythmic activity. Talking, the way I even make sounds, the letters, is a rhythmic frequency produced by my mouth. The words, our dialogue happens in a very rhythmic manner, and actual conversations are rhythmic exchanges between people. You can, if you dive into studying language and communication, walking, moving, dancing, these are all rhythmic. Singing is rhythmic. And most important, breathing is rhythmic. And since you're alive, you're breathing, because if you weren't, you wouldn't be alive. Uh, and that makes everything you do rhythmic. And that may not be obvious at first. Uh, we'll do some experiments. So, uh, go ahead and sit up in your chairs a little bit so you're not leaning on your back. And just stick an arm out there. It doesn't really matter where you're pointing it, but just kind of hold it out in space. And now take some really deep breaths with your chest. And you might notice, if you look at the end of your arm, that your hand is moving in space as you do this. Right? So just because you're breathing, your body is moving. Now, that's fine. Maybe, okay, that's a passive action. So now let's, let's, let's take this one step further. I, let's actively try to hold our hand still. Point your finger at something so you can say, hey, here's my reference target. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to move my finger at all. This is going to be the most asymmetrical activity I can possibly do. Right? I'm going to hold my finger still. Now take some big, deep chest breaths. And notice your shoulder. Notice your upper body. It's all in motion. Right? So in order to hold your finger still, your muscles of your upper body and arm have to continually move through an oscillatory process to counteract your breathing. So because you're alive, your muscles are always in rhythmic motion. And there's been research coming out uh, looking at the output of the motor cortex from the brain and other centers of motion control. And they really see that the outputs are rhythmic signals. Uh, and they are in the force domain more so than in the uh, position domain. But uh, so with rhythm at the heart of things, I want to ask you guys to do an experiment for me. Would you all try to come uh, to clap together in unison? I'm not going to lead you, right? You're going to figure this out on yourselves. Just come into some uniform clapping. <laughs> all right. Good. You guys, you guys, you guys are right there at the little bit faster than average, I think. Um, turns out to be pretty easy to do, right? You, you, there was. No central control here. You didn't have a shared clock. You didn't have any, you know, I wasn't directing you, yet you were able to, in a distributed manner, come up with a synchronized behavior. And this is very important. Uh, you see this property all throughout nature. There are fireflies that all flash in unison. Um, that's just one example. And uh, this is a uh, interesting thing, right? There's, again, no king, queen, firefly. They don't have a shared time. They don't have a shared clock. Synchronization is not occurring through a centralized mechanism. Turns out it's very easy to simulate this. The algorithm that you see here on the left started as a randomized field. Each dot is oscillating on a set period, and at a certain point that oscillation, it, it flashes. And each dot is aware of the firing of the dots exactly next to it. And their timing of the other flashes of those immediately next to it can slightly shift uh, each dot's timing. So you start with a randomized field, you let it run for a while with this very simple algorithm, and eventually you get a synchronized coordinated behavior. Uh, turns out you can do the same thing uh, in, in many information spaces. You can put a bunch of metronomes on a table and start them in random different uh, configurations, and they will all eventually synchronize. This is the same thing like a grandfather clock. The key to all of this is that anything that oscillates that shares information in some means with the other oscillators is able to synchronize. And this is a mathematical property. It's independent of the physics involved. So the metronomes on the table are sharing a small amount of physical vibration through that table. And that's enough to cause them to synchronize. Uh, yeah. Correct. You could, you could uh, uh, replicate the same thing as long as there's shared energy in some way, shared information in some way causes a slight forcing of each other. So you find this property in, in how uh, galaxies and planets move and how they synchronize their motion with each other. You, so it's, it's, uh, it's, you happen in very inanimate objects. It happens all throughout biology and lots of different uh, scenarios. There's a great book called Sync 
by a mathematician, Stephen Stogartz, that really dives into depth about this, and I highly recommend reading it. And it, so it turns out then, with these properties existing, right, uh, a mathematical property of the universe that enables the emergence of order, made, enables the emergence of coordinated behavior, turns out then that with that property laying around there, nature seems to be using it heavily. And so modern neural science is starting to dive really heavily into uh, looking at neurons as oscillators, as rhythmic systems that uh, um, produce signals in, in different frequencies and synchronize with each other in different ways. And that the brain is primarily concerned with rhythm, timing, and temporal prediction. And if you think about it, if everything else in life is rhythmic, if other animals are rhythmic in the way they move, if the time of day is rhythmic, if food cycles are rhythmic, the sun going up and down is rhythmic, then it is inherently sensible that your computational system that's trying to make you efficient at life is going to be based on rhythmic predictions and rhythmic timing. And what better way to do that than itself being a rhythmic system? Beyond just the neurons, you have these little micro circuits of neurons in your, in your brain. They actually are all throughout. They, you, they're very closely associated with locomotion. You find them throughout the spine and also throughout the brain. And they're called central pattern generators. Now, what's neat about them is that they are able to produce stable rhythmic outputs, independent of input. So if you get a couple circuits, a couple of neurons hooked up in just the right way of inhibition and excitation of each other, um, they will just sit there and they will pulsate as a group, and uh, no matter what you do to them. And if you influence them, if you put in different signals, it will shift their phasing and their timing and the amplitude of that output oscillation. And these are very robust systems that are very closely associated, as I said, with locomotion, but they're found throughout the body and throughout the brain, right? They're found all throughout the cortex and the neocortex, too. So the, the fundamental quality of central pattern generators is, is uh, universal in our computational system. And the name central pattern generator, it's a bit of a, it, it can be a bit of a red herring because what's really neat about these is that they enable distributed computation. They enable distributed systems of, of uh, control where networks of CPGs can uh, coordinate and create uh, meaningful behavior. So with our snake robot there, we got it moving using a, a network of CPGs. There's no top-down control. There's no top-down analysis of this complex structure with you know, hundreds of degrees of freedom. Instead, each string has its own little CPG oscillator controller, and they are connected to each other. They're able to influence each other through phase and, and amplitude signals, and that helps the system adapt. Go ahead. Right, They're, the muscles are shortening and lengthening, and that behavior is controlled by this little oscillatory CPG controller. The controllers influence each other. You know, they actually share their little signals between each other to create coordination. And the structure influences each other. Because it's a tension network, when one cable tightens, that actually has an impact on all the other ones too. So you get this uh, qualitative matching between what's going on with the physical forces in the structure and what's happening with the uh, control structure. And the neat thing is, without needing to uh, have a model of the external world, this type of system is able to be very adaptive and, for instance, adapt to hills and, and adapt to the blocks that you saw. So one reason why you see these CPGs uh, in locomotion systems is that they are very robust to perturbations. It's instead of creating a very rigid motion pattern that's precisely controlled, it's a very adaptable motion pattern that comes out. Uh, and this is then really leading us back around to the final question um, that we've seen in uh, all along here, which is, what is the heart of our intelligence? Right? If you find this throughout our locomotion system, throughout the basis of how we move and how our neurons work, this idea of oscillation and synchronization being at the heart of uh, what we do, then you see all these other these qualities, like how do we, how do we um, when we go and hang out with a new group of people for a few years, we take on their linguistic you know, nuances. We start uh, speaking with the, uh, with the um, oh shoot, what's the word? Um, accent, thank you. you know, the accent of whatever, you know, whatever community that we're in. Um, how we are so good at seeing the relationship between people and the categorization of stuff, seeing like you all, every single person in this room looks quite different. Yet it's very easy for us as humans to say, look, this, these are all people, these are all faces, these are all hands and arms and elbows and t-shirts and whatnot. 
Um, we're very good at that. These are things, though, that are very difficult for uh, traditional AI systems to, to pursue. And so to tie all of this then back to, uh, to the bigger story of, you know, for instance, what SETI is trying to do, if you're looking for intelligence, it may be that, you know, looking for these types of, uh, looking for uh, patterns of, uh, that are rhythmic is at the heart of a lot of perhaps other intelligence will also have tapped into this. Because, again, this is a property that comes in nature. Right? Because it's a map property. The fact that you systems off oscillators, you can get coordinated, coordinated, uh, coordinated uh, behaviors and structure and order. Right. In some respects, you could say this is the quality that life has that is the answer to entropy. If systems are always decaying and losing order, why is it that we are so structured and so organized? Because we use rhythm at the heart of it all. Thank you. Oh. I forgot the most important slide. This is not just my work. There's an entire team of students from around the world and, uh, and around the country that has been supporting this. Thank you very much. I'm glad I mentioned that you practice yoga and dance. Now I understand where the motivation, yes. how this work connects with you, your pastime. Absolutely. Great talk. Thank you. Uh, we're going to open the floor for questions. Um, I've, let's start here. Well, as just as you surmise, uh, nature has beaten you to the punch. I'm, I'm thinking of a uh, uh, jellyfish have uh, no central nervous system, mm -hmm. and yet they uh, operate in a completely coordinated fashion. And, uh, and they're totally adaptable, and so uh, so it seems like uh, that's that that's sort of the ultimate uh, organic version of what you're trying to produce. Thank you, thank you for the reminder about them. I've yeah. I've heard that before, but I've forgotten to research it in a while. So, the uh, some of these examples you have, it would seem, would would uh, uh, have their capabilities uh, reduced when there is damage to one of the tension points. Have you looked at mechanisms of self-repair and, and, and diagnosis ahead of time of, of weakened tension points? And mm -hmm. then that's probably easier to repair than a completely broken one. But right. I'm curious about self-repair, which would be particularly important if you're going to put these on some uh, you know, extra uh, terrestrial location. Right, yeah, it's, it's a, a really good question. The, um, it, it sort of leads to this bigger question of what are the appropriate forms of active materials, compliant materials, controllable, you know, tensile materials to use for these types of robots? Um, and uh, I'm actually diving into that direction this year in terms of my research and uh, work with folks who've got, uh, you know, carbon nanotube technologies and other like active, uh, actively controlled tensile materials. Um, but it's a it's a hard question, right? The, none of those materials are quite at the uh, really ready for prime time as a technology yet. And just so far as my research has gone to this point, I've taken the approach of uh, I'm already innovating in at least in eight or nine different directions. So I've, I'm using traditional motors and cables and whatnot just to kind of bound the scope of the project. But uh, I'm trying to open it up slowly as, as we're making progress. I will show this one spare video. I'm, I'm glad you asked this question because I, I, I put this extra video in just to show that even if you remove one of the links, we've removed one of the cables here uh, that would normally have gone between these two rods, we can still get this thing to roll. Uh, and so that's in different than what I showed earlier where the robot was still fully connected but had only a quarter of the actuators. So fundamentally, these are parallel structures, right? They're like a parallel mechanism. And so they are v thus very uh, uh, robust to various individual component failures. Uh, which is one of the qualities that is also nice. From this to Absolutely, yeah. They're, they're, you can lose various components in this function. In we have a question here. Yes. So obviously you've started uh, from one end with a robotics look and gone to previous tensegrity research, and on your rhythm end you've got a snake, uh, and this gentleman mentioned jellyfish. Are any of your extended team working on other animal models? Can you illuminate a little more on, on have you got a sky jellyfish which shoots laser sharks yet? <laughs> <laughs> That's a direct question. Um, I am looking for the right student to work on that. <laughs> um, we are really, so you've played around with other models. You 
at uh, a couple back here. Like there, you know, instead of just the snake, we're also really trying to explore into a bit more of, a, of a, the spine model. And this is a model inspired by some of Tom Fleming's uh, physical model that he made of a pelvis type mechanism that could eventually be a legged system. And so I have a vision of putting these things together and eventually making a quadruped where you get some legs and you add them to a spine and you have now a little dog. Um, or whatever you want to call it, you know, some, any, any quadruped animal. So that's the direction I'm trying to go. But uh, uh, as you can tell, there's a lot of directions to go. So it's happening slower than I would like and faster than one might realize. Yeah. You mentioned earlier <coughs> life is rhythmic. I wonder, the generation of new ideas, or sometimes called inspiration, is that process rhythmic? It doesn't happen, it doesn't happen on a steady state basis, at least not for an individual. Uh, uh, I, I've, uh, so I, I don't know of any studies that have looked at that. But I certainly know that uh, in my own experience, new ideas happen um, yeah, you can't just push your way straight towards them. They happen in, in their own way, and they, they emerge at unexpected moments for me. So maybe a study of it that says that there's some uh, rhythm at which an individual can, can innovate. Um, but it's an interesting question. It would be good to maximize that. Hmm? Yeah. I certainly find, at least in my, uh, my own work, uh, it's easy to generate ideas, but to really innovate, you need to pulsate between idea generation and execution, and actually building and trying and, and whatnot, because it's in that hands-on process of actually working with the problem that you then see further enlightenment about the ideas that are percolating in your head. So you, you need that fluctuation between the two. Okay, I have a very dry question, a, a scientist question here. Um, have you done a study for compared the amount of energy you will need to move a structure like this compared mm -hmm. to moving a structure with wheels like a rover. Yeah. Uh, if you to convince a NASA scientist to have uh, something like this on Mars, that's the first question they're gonna ask, where are you gonna put, how much energy you need to move a structure like this, mm -hmm. and where are you going to put the scientific payload? Right, well the, uh, the payload that you can see our general idea is that the, the primary payload would be at the s a sphere suspended in the middle because that's where you end up protecting it from all the shocks and forces. Uh, and you can deform the structure enough so that the, you could actually put that payload up against the outside edge of the overall structure. So it's not like it's, it would be, it would be able to have an instrument that was going to do a measurement on a rock and whatnot just through the shape deformation. Um, so, uh, and we've done a lot of studies that really show that you really can protect that payload in landing scenarios, much like you can with an airbag, and manage the amount of g-forces it experiences. So that was your second question. The first question is, is absolutely relevant, the uh, question of how do you power these and, and how efficient are they? Um, and as we're building our next prototype, that's going to be one of the questions we're really going to be able to answer, you know, was we have it moving in terms of how efficient it is. Uh, our initial experiments in simulation show it to be fairly energy efficient, partially because you can get a lot of energy store. That same thing that you see in biology, where in every motion, uh, a lot of energy gets stored in the tensile uh, material of the body, i.e. your muscles. You actually preload the springs of your muscles during a step and then re-release re that energy as you go. So that can actually uh, be quite efficient. In biology, you know, you would imagine, uh, it should be possible to build a, a, a robotic horse with a one horsepower motor, um, but our <laughs> we don't do that right now. <laughs> um, so, uh, 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 but there's a lot more to be done down that direction, looking at, at the actual energy consumption of how it really works. The, the thing is, though, uh, what makes a good mission is not just energy efficiency, right? One of the key ideas here is that besides, yeah, it's also mass efficiency is a major driver, how heavy a system is to launch to another planet. And that's actually one of the key drivers of this approach from a planetary exploration perspective, is that because you're combining multiple different functions, you're combining your landing system and your mobility system and your deployment system all in one structure, the overall ratio of the mass of the system relative to the amount of scientific instrumentation you can land 
is really beneficial. And we did some calculations in the phase one of this study that showed that, um, you know, based on various assumptions of how heavy things would be, uh, that this would give you sort of twice the ratio of science instruments to, to mass that, say, MSL has. Um, another quality that the SEPA system has that's really beneficial is that it changes your risk profile for how you explore another planet. If you've built a robot that is inherently able to land from orbit, then if you wanted to explore up to the very edge of a cliff, because that's right where some interesting exposed rock there are, you might go ahead and do that. You might take the risk of falling off the cliff because you can fall from orbit. Even more importantly, besides just doing that, there are uh, one of the places that, for instance, on Mars that people are really focused on these days for future exploration are the skylights. Right? There are these open, uh, there are tunnels underground in Mars, uh, likely from lava uh, tubes that have broken open ceilings that you can see from space, uh, where it's cave exploration that you can get into. How do you get down into them without repelling down or whatnot? So again, if you can fall from orbit, you could roll up to the edge of a skylight, fall in, and start exploring around. And so it changes the question. It's not always going to be about efficiency of power. Thank you. In the simulations, we were not modeling a particular energy source, right? This is a sort of abstract cable <laughs> actuation. I mean, if you mean. No, we're, we're actively uh, changing the lengths of the cables to get them to move, right? Um, in our, in our uh, hardware prototypes, each cable, each rod has some batteries in it and a motor and an actuator, and, and that's how that actually gets implemented. <coughs> okay, uh, my question had to do with uh, musicians and specifically a pianist. Uh, mm. I'm beginning to understand how they can hit so many keys so fast. They must have these uh, control generators up and down in their fingers, arms. Mm -hmm. um, does that just, is that going to require practice, practice, practice? Yes. Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you get to Carnegie Hall. Any, yeah. uh, anyway, uh, so I, I have a question about um, small airless bodies like asteroids mm -hmm. and also maybe something like the moon, but things with like really low gravity. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, so there are some places that we might want to land things where the escape velocity is really like if you if you jump too high, yeah. you know it it you're off in space. So I, I, I would want to know how you you know deal with with that kind of problem. And also a place like the moon, where if your uh, half of your body is in sunlight and half is in shadow, the temperature is really really different on the two halves, and the the heat expansion and contraction mm. might be a factor. <coughs> um. So yeah, we, we've initially, we've put our most, the most amount of study we've done into landing on Titan, where we have it's low gravity and a thick atmosphere, which really makes the landing speeds quite amenable. Um, and, uh, uh, but that being said, the key vision is that this type of structure will allow you to land at a higher speed than you would otherwise be able to, right? It's going to absorb higher impacts. Uh, and, uh, and it's, again, acting much like an airbag. Um, so it should be uh, extensible to other locations. I don't know yet what the upper bound of the types of speeds it can take. That's one reason why we're trying to move away from just doing simulation studies to actually building hardware and really being able to test it out and get some, you know, bit more boots on the ground, sense, you know, where does, where does theory and reality meet here? Um, but uh, so to the extent that it enables you to hit somewhere harder and faster, it would be apl applicable to a lot of locations. Uh, we have looked a little bit at um, landing on asteroids. One of the things we found in some of our simulations of landing is depending on the configuration that you land at, and, and so you might be able to control that, uh, the landing event actually would cause it to change translational energy into rotational energy, and the whole thing would start spinning in the air after it bounced. And so it, that struck me as a potentially useful aspect. Um, of course, you then you need to figure out how to de-spin that. But you know, there's, <laughs> there's, it's, it's again a hint that there's something valuable here. Uh, another thing that I've thought that would be very ap appropriate for exploring uh, near-Earth objects and asteroids, where you really have to concern yourself with bouncing off of the the very thing you're trying to uh, move on is that these are very deformable structures, right? The, and you can control their shape very well. So uh, besides just rolling, 
you should be able to do a lot of sort of stemming and gripping and other means of trying to create positive uh, grip on the surface. So you could be using all of these bars, you could be pushing them out in different ways to brace yourself against the surface or like a, uh, like a martial artist who wants to really have a good stance, you actually squeeze towards the midline. Even though your feet aren't moving, you're creating an isometric force that actually gives you grip on the ground. And, and, you know, one, reason to, one way to move powerfully. Um, and it's also worth realizing that we're studying the six bar uh, morphology, the six bar shape, because it's the simplest shape that gives the qualities that we're looking for, but it is by no means the only shape. You could have, uh, a, there's a huge range of shapes that are possible. You could have a 30 bar version of this that looks much more like a sphere and give it even more deformability and more ability to sort of adapt to and, sh and form to the terrain. So there's, there's ideas in that direction that I would love to explore as time and energy enables me to, that I think would be appropriate to those various scenarios. Yeah, so how are you going to deal with like, everybody's been for a hike in the mud. Everybody's been hiking in the mud, yeah. in the dirt, and there's a lot of environments. These things, uh, I don't know how you're going to um, self-clean up with some vibration tendency in it, but if you've been hiking in the mud, shaking your boot off, it's tricky. Yeah. And uh, the other thing is, uh, some of these places are, are very, very cold, one Kelvin, two Kelvin. I'm not sure how that your uh, equipment work or what materials mm -hmm. you'd anticipate using for such extreme temperatures. Right. Um, and, and the key thing that you're, I think you're alluding to is it's a really, it's a really valuable you know, insight about exploring our solar system. We have so many different environments out there. Uh, not every technology is going to be appropriate for every environment. And, and I think that's you know, just an you know, a, a in, a insight that we all need to accept. And so it helps to have a bigger uh, toolkit of different technologies that are going to be appropriate in different places. Um, in terms of dealing with temperature, uh, Specifically, since we rely so heavily on this idea of tensile materials and elastic materials in our designs, I've looked a little bit down this direction of what would be uh, like uh, appropriate materials to be using on Titan, uh, and um, that is part of why I'm getting involved in the carbon nanotube yarns research right now. We've seen in the literature in carbon nanotube there are uh, some emerging research materials that maintain elastic properties down to negative 200 C and beyond. And so that's really compelling because that gives you a range of temperatures that uh, sort of more traditional springs would not survive at. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, but the, the sort of that, those questions of like, how would you engineer the materials for an actual space mission is something I would really like to dive into when uh, point of really having the concept proven out to the point that real, real mission engineering dollars become available. Right now, this has all been done on uh, absolute tiny shoestring budgets of very low TRL research funding. Um, so chipping away at all the different questions, but it's a very, it is a very relevant question to how to, how to engineer at those different environments. Um, we're currently using for our cables, uh, our current prototype is using Vectran which was uh, also used on the parachute cables for the uh, landing the MER rovers. And that also shows a uh, really high resilience and strength at low temperatures. In fact, the studies, only, the studies that were done on it only went down to negative 60 C, I believe, and they were showing at those temperatures that it actually was getting stronger. And they didn't, they didn't go to lower temperatures than that. The curve was increasing at that point. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 One of the one of the one of the other ideas is, and again, something I haven't been able to tackle yet, uh, but where I would like to go eventually is looking at you know uh, flexible materials and skins that you would wrap it in. That would really address a number of concerns, such as how you know what happens with the rods getting stuck in the mud and things like that. But by having a, a membrane around the outside of it, you would uh, essentially be able to float on mud a lot more. And again, how you have the mud gooped on you, I don't know yet. I haven't, I haven't tried that. <laughs> Pardon?
you get a very large surface area of contact. Again, if you have a membrane around it, you would have a very large contact for mass volume compared to a rover with wheels. So there are, again, some advantages, and you would have to tune it for the environment. Let's go on to the next question. Yeah, so as you alluded, I think some people in the room are, are really surprised at how far along you really are. I think it's fantastic, which means it made me want to think, are any of the Google Lunar X Prize teams talking to you about using this potential technology to get their surface motion? Or is this something that could be included in one of Entrepreneurial Mars 2018 flybys that gets dropped off? Yeah. Um, no, I've, I've presented the ideas to Lunar Express since they're right there. Um, Moon Express? And, anyways. Um, thank you. Um, and, uh, uh, but no one's, no one's actively uh, using the concept that I know of. Um, and it is, you know, if someone wanted to, I would love to talk to them, especially if they want to help fund the research. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, it's, it, it is still quite early stage work. I mean, it, in terms of we are proving out concepts in the lab and here terrestrially, it would be another big step to start making an actual flight qualified system, you know, and, and, and uh, that's, that's definitely a chunk of work to go, but there's a lot of potential here that I think is applicable to many of these use cases. Okay, so we're going to close the question, but you are staying here for like 15, 20 minutes at yeah. least, right? So Hello, you, yeah. you feel free to come to speak to, to Vita. And thank you again, please. Yeah. Because you can to set in situ, you have a robot. Oh, fantastic. Uh, oh, nice. security.